Hey, I just wanted to quickly plug that if you guys want any tutoring, some new slots have opened. If you look in the description, there's a link to my physics and maths tutor profile in which I do tutoring on there. Hello everybody, welcome back to the A-Level Cookbook. Today we're going to be doing the OCR A-Level Biology A, June 2018, Paper 3. This onion plant is grown as a crude crop around the world. The table below contains statements about the root cells of an onion. Place ticks in the boxes to indicate whether the statements are true or false. So we're looking at onion root cells, so roots won't have chloroplasts in them. They will have mitochondria because they do heloactive transport. 70S ribosomes are found in prokaryotes, and these are eukaryotic, so that's out. Pili are again found in bacteria, so that's out. And cellular cell walls are in a plant, so that's, there you go. So figure one shows a cross-section of a root of an onion plant. Name the figures M and N, the tissues. So um, generally speaking, these little teeny ones on the outer side tend to be the phloem, whereas these bigger ones are the xylem. So there you go. So the color of onion bulbs is determined by two genes. A is dominant and codes for the production of a red pigment. Onion bulbs that are homozygous recessive allele A produce no pigment, pigment or white. B is a dominant allele that inhibits the expression of A, and the recessive allele little b lags the production in the red pigment. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just quickly draw like a little flow chart on this of what's going on. So red pigment, that is big A, and um, what is it, and little b, whereas little a doesn't allow production, of, there's no pigment made. L big B is a dominant allele that inhibits the expression of A, and then Little b allows the production of red pigment, so like this, there we go. So why onion plant was cross-pollinated with a red one, all offspring had this genotype. So let's just have a quick look at the parents. So if all of them had big A, little a, big B, little b, then they must, the parents must have been, well, if it's a white onion plant, it must have been little a, little bit, little a, little a, right, to be able to be white, but then it must have been big B, big B, because if all of the offspring had this genotype, then you must have had homozygous in both parents for each bit, if that makes sense. So the red onion plant would be, well, it's been able to be red, and it has to be homozygous for this, a so big A, big A, and then little b, little be because if you cross those two then all the offspring would be that then it says the phenotype of the offspring so if they're big a little a right that suggests it could be red but then they've got big b which inhibits the red so they actually stay white so they are white or they have no pigment so then it says name the type of gene interaction shown by these genes so it's called epistasis the reason is is because you've got two genes interacting with each other and one inhibits the expression of the other so for example here there's you with your hair and then here's you with your hair, without hair, sorry, right? Even if you have black hair, brown hair, blonde hair, ginger hair, whatever color hair, right? If you have a no hair allele, it doesn't matter what like hair color you have because the blonde, the bold hair allele, sorry, is inhibiting the expression of the color as in it's demonstrating epistasis there. So epistasis means after stoppage. So now it says suggest how allele B inhibits the expression of allele A. So if we just rewind and figure out what's going on again, so. A is a dominant allele that codes for the production of a pigment, right? And, for, and B, it's a dominant allele that inhibits the expression of allele A. So something is getting in the way of stopping A being expressed. When you're expressing something, what you have to do is you have to transcribe and you have to translate it. So you have to make an mRNA copy of it, and then you've got to go to ribosomes, put amino acids together, and, you know, make a polypeptide. So in this case, what's happening is that if B's stopping the expression of A, it's stopping the mRNA being made of A, and then hence stopping the transcription and translation, right? So what it is is that B, because you can have repressor proteins or transcription factors that repress um, transcription, so B could code for a repressor protein. What this do, do, will do sorry, is it binds to the A promoter region and prevents... RNA polymerase from transcribing A, the A gene, into mRNA. Therefore, it's not translated, and therefore, it's not expressed. A lot of people just kind of said allele B turned off A. Well, that's, yeah, no, no, you know, that's what it's saying in the question as well. It's showing you, you have to show your knowledge of how it's actually stopping allele A from being expressed, which in this case could be that. Other, other options you could have said is that maybe B codes for a product that inhibits enzymes made by A, or you could have gone and said, well, B makes this thing like a protein that stops the translation of allele A. But yeah, that's what I, this is what I would have gone for. So ATP can be produced in various ways. Each stage of respiration contributes to the production of ATP. Describe the production of ATP by substrate level phosphorylation in different stages of respiration with reference to the number of ATP molecules produced. Substrate level phosphorylation is where you grab an, a phosphate group from a molecule and then use that phosphate from another molecule to then high, you know, pr produce um, ATP from ADP and PI. So we need to think about all the stages in respiration from start to finish where that happens. The whole point of glycolysis is to make pyruvate, which is a three carbon compound, right? But two of them from glucose. So in order to break down glucose, what we do in glycolysis 
is we use um, two ATPs, right? And put phosphates on it. And what happens is you get hexose bisphosphate, right? And then what happens is that hexose bisphosphate will break down into two triose phosphate. And at this point, the triose phosphate is then oxidized. If you're oxidizing something, you have to reduce something else. So then NAD comes along and there's two of them and it gets reduced. So you get two reduced NAD, you get pyruvate. But at the same time, we're going to peel off those phosphates, the hexose bisphosphate part. But then also two other ATPs are just made for a side reaction that you don't need to know about. So then you get four ADP plus PI makes four ATP. So you have a net gain of two ATPs there because you have to use two up to start with. Now in the link reaction, what happens is you've got pyruvate, you remove a CO2, you oxidize it, and you get reduced NAD, and then you end up making acetate, and it binds with acetyl-CoA. Sorry, it binds with um, coenzyme A to make acetyl-CoA. Now the next place that you have substrate level phosphorylation is in the Krebs cycle. In the Krebs cycle, you have oxaloacetate, which then combines with this with the CoA, and you get citrate, which is six carbons, and then you get this five carbon compound. So in order to go from a six to a five carbon compound, we need to have put out a CO2. In the same sense, it's been you get reduced NAD because it's been oxidized. And then what happens is, to get back to a four carbon, you need to re remove a CO2, and a lot of things happen as well. So you get an NA a reduced NAD, you also get an ATP from here as well, from substrate level phosphorylation as well. And then you get another a reduced NAD and a reduced FAD, there you go. So that's where substrate level phosphorylation is happening. To put this into words, in glycolysis, there is a net yield or gain or whatever you want to use of two ATP. Two ATP molecules are hydrolyzed and glucose is phosphorylated. I write phosphor sure, but you write the whole thing, obviously. To produce hexose, this phosphate breaks down into TP, which is then oxidized to pyruvate while producing four ATP. So remember, because we've used two up, we've got a net gain of two. And in the Krebs cycle, one ATP is produced when reconverting five carbon compound back to oxalo acid. There you go. So glucose and other carbohydrates are present in respiring cells. The concentration of carbohydrate molecules varies between tissues. A student conducted tests on three tissues, A, B, and C, and table two shows the results of these tests. So in tissue A, we add Benedict's test, we get red color. And then we, when we add him, um, HCL is still red. And after iodine, it's yellow. Whereas in B, we um, get a yellow color. When we add HCL, we get some red. So that implies that there's more mon reducing sugars here at this point. And then after our iodine test, it's black. And then here, it's orange. It's still orange, but it's black. So Fine. Two of the tissues were known to be phloem tissue and liver tissue. Use the evidence in your table to identify which one's which and explain your answer. So animals don't store starch, remember? So that means we're not going to have black in the iodine test. So that immediately has to be the liver because we don't have starch in our bodies. Now we need to identify which ones are phloem. So in my head, I'm thinking, right, okay, we're dealing with, we're dealing with reducing sugars. We've got disaccharides that are breaking down into reducing sugars and we have starch. So in the phloem, I need to think, oh, what's being transported in the phloem? In the phloem, we're moving about sucrose. Sucrose is in there and that's a disaccharide, right? So if you're adding HCL and then doing Benedict's test, you'd have more reducing sugar present. So it'd start to go red or like more, right? So that's gone from orange and state orange, nothing's added in. But if that goes yellow to red, that means there's more reducing sugar here. So that must be the phloem. So that tissue B must be the phloem because it contains a it will contain sucrose, which is hydrolyzed into reducing sugars, which are monosaccharides, right? And then tissue, or what letter was it again? A must be the liver because it does not contain starch. There you go. So cells can use fatty acids instead of carbohydrates as respiratory substrates. A process called beta oxidation is used to break down fatty acids to acetyl-CoA for use in respiration. And here's a simplified example. So fatty acid, coenzyme A, it makes palmitoyl coa uh, hydrogen atoms are transferred, H2O goes in, hydrogen atoms are transferred, CoA goes in, and we get shortened acyl-CoA and then acetyl-CoA. Using the information in figure two, calculate the percentage of carbon atoms in the fatty acid that are able to enter the... So we need to look at this diagram and figure out what part of it's actually being used in respiration. There's a whole load of other stuff happening here. Now in the question, it's hinted at, first of all, beta oxidation is used to break down fatty acids to acetyl-CoA for use in respiration. So that's going to go in respiration. And also in the Krebs cycle, you guys aren't familiar with anything else other than, you know, acetyl-CoA going to the Krebs cycle. So if that's the case, then in acetyl-CoA, you should know that that's a two carbon compound because pyruvate was decarboxylated in the link reaction to make acetate, which is then, you know, put on the um, coenzyme A to make acetyl-CoA, right? And it's asking you the percentage of carbon atoms from the fatty acid that are able to get there. And originally in this fatty acid, we had one and then 14 of those, right? So 15 and then another one, 16. So we have 16 carbons in that thing. So fatty acid, at 16 carbons. So two out of the 16 were actually able to get in there. So two out of 16 times 100 is 0 0.125, which is roughly 12.5%, which is six to number of significant figures in the question, but which doesn't seem to really give us any. So well, I'm just gonna put 12.5%, there you go. The percentage of carbon atoms that a reaction makes available for use in the Krebs cycle can be described as the efficiency of the reaction. Calculate the efficiency of the link reaction using your answer to part one. State whether the link reaction is more, less, or equally efficient when compared to the reactions described in figure two. 
So here, what it's saying is that you're, you're putting, basically working out the same thing we were just doing there. So here, in the link reaction, what you have is you have pyruvate, right? That's three carbons. What happens is it gets decarboxylated, CO2 is out, and it also gets oxidized as well. So something else has to be reduced, so you get reduced NAD in the process. What you end up getting is you get acetate, right? Which then joins with coenzyme A to make acetyl-CoA. So here, we had three carbons and two's actually gone in. So we have two out of three, two that are enter able to enter from three, which is 67%. So that means it's 67%, right? And the link reaction is more efficient because the question's told you that this is how efficient it is. So figure two shows the role of coenzyme A in beta oxidation, state a role for coenzymes other than coenzyme A in beta oxidation. Coenzymes are things that aid the function of other molecules, right? One of the big things is that we use NAD, FAD, right? So you would say, I'm going to pick NAD. So NAD, and what does it do? It is reduced. You can just say that. There you go. Temperature and light intensity are two factors that affect the rate of photosynthesis. A student investigated how temperature and light intensity affect the rate of photosynthesis in this aquatic plant. The rate of photosynthesis is measured by counting the number of bubbles produced by the plant per minute. So here's our data. So let's write down what our independent and our dependent variables are. So independent is light and intensity, and then the also its temperature, and then their dependent is the number of bubbles a minute, which they're using to estimate the rate of photosynthesis. Fine. So here's the results, whatevs. And now it says, identify the anomalous result in table three and explain how this can be confirmed as an anomaly. So temperature is the same here. So between all four of these reactions, the only factor changing is light intensity, right? So if we increase the light intensity, then we see that the rate of the number of bubbles and hence the rate of photosynthesis goes up. Fine. If we now look, some, look at this next chunk here, we're increasing the light intensity, 25, 28, 118, 133. Fine. Okay. Then if we have a look at the next chunk, so 8, 32, 126. So we're increasing this, right? And we can see that this goes up, this goes up so forth, right? So here, I need to figure out which one's the anomaly and what it could be. So these are all at a higher temperature. And if you see here, if we keep the temperature and the light intensity the same, and we keep the light intensity the same, but change the temperature here, that's 25 versus 10, right? That's 31, 28. That's lower than this, but it should be higher, to, surely. If look at the next one. This 118 is higher than that. And if we look here as well, this 133 is higher than that. So this 28 is a bit odd. Why is it like lower when it should be higher? Right? And here, the temperature must have been too high because it's like teeny and way lower than the original. The anomaly here would be the one, two, three, four, five, sixth row. There you go. So the sixth row, it's the 28 bubbles per, was it bubbles per minute? Yeah, per minute. And then it says, explain how this can be confirmed as a anomaly. So it's not just like, you know, plot points on a graph or anything like that. What you need to do is you've got to do a repeat. The reason is, imagine you gave me a chocolate bar that was 100 grams. And then uh, another one that was like some mysterious thing. And then another one that was 100 grams, right? And they're all the same physical size like this. Okay, they're all that. And then let's say I weigh this and for some reason I get 1,000 grams. But they all look like this, right? And then I weigh another one and then I get like 980 grams. Okay? Now I don't know which one are the anomalous results. Obviously, we'd be tempted to be like, oh, it's the 1,980. Clearly, these are this big, blah, 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 blah. But like, it's, you can't just do that. You have to prove what the reasons are for it to be this way. It could be that I've messed up the scale. It could be that it truly is that. Right. But if I then go and weigh a load more and I get like 300 lots of 100 grams, so I've got that many, then I know these two are anomalies now because every single other one lies like, you know, very close to each other in the hundreds, whereas this is way out and that's way out as well. But then again, we need to find like a reason as to why that's the case as well. You can't just like eliminate it. You've got to think, OK, well, why is that result anomalous? What did I do wrong? Can I be changed? Is there a reason? Describe how the student can improve their method and the presentation of their data. So let's go through their method one by one and talk about each bit one by one. So here, the reason I wrote the independent variable and the dependent variables here is because anything that screws up the dependent variable is something that needs to be controlled or fixed because you want to make sure your independence, so your light or your temperature, are the only things changing the number of bubbles per minute. And there's no mention of all the other things that could screw this up, like pH, right? So what we need to do is we need to go in and basically critique it line by line. So in terms of their method, what did they do? They did this blah, blah, blah. They measured it by counting the number of bubbles produced by the plant per minute. Are we going to sit and look at how many bubbles it makes? Because that's very subjective and very also just you might miss it. It's human error speed running, right? So it's better to try and use something that involves fewer measurements because this is going to be like bubble, 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 right? Whereas you could just look at like starting position, ending position, for example, and you'll know like there's two things that you've got to do and you can leave it for a set time as well. So here, one better thing we could do is count using and then you could think of an alternative thing. So count. Uh, well, sorry, measure rate with, and for me, I'm going to just go with gas syringe. That's probably pretty easy. And you should leave, and you know, count rate with this as gas syringe over time in a fixed time. So you could leave it for like 30 minutes and then divide your answer by 30 minutes to get it per minute. There you go. 
And then I was saying they haven't mentioned anything about what could screw this up. So the screwing up of the rate of photosynthesis, what that could be is, well, they've, you know, for example, it could be controlling the pH, um, the water content of the thing it's in. What's this in? Is it just the, uh, the water that it's in? So the plant is in because it's an aquatic organism. As well as that, you know, maybe we could leave them to acclimatize once you've changed the temperature and stuff like that, rather than just diving in. So it's, there's no mention of that. So climatize to temperature, like I'm thinking of every single possible thing that can screw up are dependent. And you have to work out what the question says. If it's not there, then it's probably something that needs to be addressed because in the method, it surely should say every single control. As well as that, some way, photosynthesis depends on light, temperature, and CO2. So some way of controlling CO2 as well. Here, let's say for the light stuff, right? That's the sweet spot here. And for like temperature and light, this is the sweet spot here. Why on earth is this guy going 832, 127, 510? Right, that's huge gaps between the two. Here, for example, I take this one. I don't know if that 108 was on the dot here, or it could have been like 200 and we would have been chilling, you know? So we need to use smaller and more regular and consistent intervals as well, because that's really weird scale. So you would use smaller and more regular intervals of light intensity and temperature, actually, to be honest. Like, they're just three randomly seeming things, you know? Because, for example, here, we can see that that's probably where it's been too high. But what if, like, it was on, um, you know, 55, that was too high, rather than the 70? We don't know, because we're jumping from 40.5, which is pretty happy, to 70. So it's probably good to, you know, do that. As well as that, um, if we have a look, we only have one set of results, no repeats. So definitely, we need to repeat and calculate means. And that's, like, most of the method stuff. So the other objective is to improve the results, the presentation of the data. If I have a look at the data, light intensity... There is no unit immediately. Temperatures, whatevs. Here, the number of bubbles produced per minute is this. But like, this is horrendous to read because it's a cluster of temperatures here and we're doing light. So then I've got to like, look at this chunk almost on its own and then the next chunk underneath like I did at the start. And as well as that, the units number of bubbles produced per minute, it's probably better to write what you're measuring and then how it was measured. So you would write rate of photosynthesis and then bubbles per minute rather than number of bubbles produced per minute. Cause like you should be able to look at this table and have some idea of what the original experiment was. This don't tell me nothing. Also, why not make a graph? Like who's gonna look at this and be like, yeah, I know what the patterns are. So those are the three big ones. So here I was going one by one through each bit almost. I was looking at these, what's the problem here? No units, this could be better. And then I went through each bit one by one. So we should ideally be able to read across it and be like, oh, this is the pattern here, right? But this is not very like easily readable. So immediately one thing is add units for light intensity. I would probably separate the tables for light intensity and temperature. So I'd have a table for like at 25 degrees only showing these ones, for example, rather than trying to combine it all in one. I'd change the, the bubbles produced heading to rate of photosynthesis and then put in the unit bubbles per minute because then again so you can read the table and have an idea of what's going on and also i present it as a graph so here it says photosynthesis occurs in two stages the light dependent stage and the light independent stage the light independent stage is affected by temperature more than the light dependent explain why so if we have a thing about the light independent stage we're talking about the calvin cycle right where You've got RUBP combines with CO2 using Rubisco. You get two times GP, which gets two times TP because that's been oxidized. Some useful organic compounds and eventually get back to RUBP, right? So here, for some reason, that's more quick than the light dependent reaction, which is well, real quick. But system two, for system one, light shines on an electron in the chlorophyll. It gets excited. It gets moves down the electron transport chain. Then it gets deposited in chlorophyll in photosystem one. Light shines on the electron in this photosystem. It gets too gassed and very excitable and very excited, sorry. And then it gets passed on to NADP, sorry, NADP, yep. And it becomes reduced NADP. As it moves down the electron transport chain, it's losing energy. So that's used to pump H plus like this and it moves to ATP synthesis and you make ATP right that, right? So for some reason, the other process was faster. So here, the only thing that, I, when you're increasing temperature, we're thinking about like interactions between things. All of this to do with reactions and stages and temperature is all about things banging into each other, colliding, right? And kinetic energy. So if we have a Rubisco, which is an enzyme, that's going to work faster if you have a higher temperature because of higher kinetic energy. Whereas there's not really a clear enzyme per se in the light dependent reaction. It's all about just electrons moving and you know, all of that jazz happening. Whereas in Rubisco, it's quite literally dependent. Sorry, the Calvin cycle is quite literally dependent on Rubisco. So your light dependent reaction depends on Rubisco, an enzyme, increasing the temperature, increases the kinetic energy of enzymes and substrates. Therefore, you get a higher frequency of collisions leading to enzyme substrate complexes.
There you go. Scientists are able to clone desirable plants that show a high rate of photosynthesis. The following passage describes how plants are cloned. Cells are removed from the meristem tissue in axial buds or something tips. So it's shoot tip because that's the bit we want to grab. The tissue sample that is removed is called the something. Ethanol can be used to something the plant tissue. So the word here is explant. Sadly, this is just sort of remembering the steps and the words, right? But you can kind of figure out what some of them are. So like ethanol can be used to something, right? Ethanol we use on our hands and stuff like that when we've like, you know, take it a shit. So it can be used to sterilize them, right? Rubbing alcohol. And then hormones are used to stimulate mitosis, which produces a mass of cells called a callus. It's not really a way around that one, Saz. A gamma globulinemia and Vichy syndrome are both um, genetic diseases. A gamma globulinemia causes a lack of mature B lymphocytes in a person's blood. Suggest and explain one symptom of A gamma globulinemia. So if you don't have B cells, you can't make antibodies. You can't make antibodies, you're gonna get like more and more ill when you have an infection, you're more susceptible to an infection. So that's exactly it. So you fewer antibodies made, or none really, made. Therefore, there's an increased susceptibility to infection. Entire point of like B cells is to be, you know, how it be. Make as many antibodies as you can. So figure four shows the inheritance pattern of A gamma globulinemia in a family. So let's have a quick look at what's going on. So if it's white and it's healthy, if it's great, then it's not affected, right? If we have a look, this is a healthy male, healthy female. And then we have a male with A gamma globulinemia, but we've got a healthy female, healthy female with a healthy male. And then we have two males with A gamma globulinemia, right? It says, what conclusions can you draw about the location and nature of the allele responsible causing A gamma globulinemia? And then explain your conclusions. If we have a look, we don't have any females with A gamma globulinemia, which to me, signals that it's most likely going to be X-linked, right? We still have to describe why using this. You can't just say, oh, because most males are the thing. Well, I mean, I guess that's one mark, right? But that still doesn't explain why, because it could be by pure chance that just no women had it. So you can remember that, like, if you have a, for example, a 9331 ratio and another thing, it's not always going to be 9331, because that's just a prediction. It's a probability. So here, at least we can start by saying it's probably that and then go and explain why. So it's likely sex linked on the X chromosome because only males are affected. Now, when something's sex linked, male people have these chromosomes, X, Y, where the Y is short and deformed and rubbish. Um, and what happens is, if you have like a recessive allele here, there's no corresponding dominant allele to mask it. So even if it's recessive, they'll express it. Whereas with females, it's XX. So you have here and here, even if that's recessive, you may have a dominant copy, so they don't have it, but they can still be a carrier of the, prob you know, the problem at hand. So what we need to do now is we've got to go ahead and figure out, is it dominant and recessive? Because at least you figured out the location of it. That's that bit. We need to know the nature of it. So what we do is we find like two parents that end up giving offspring the habit and see what's up, right? If this is a healthy male, then that means it's going to be, well, let's put, let's assign it, right? So we're usually familiar with it being X-linked recessive. So I'm going to say that little a is you have it, and then big A is that you are, you know, healthy, right? So if you think about it this way, this is a male, it's going to be XY. Now he's healthy, so it's got X big A, right? Now, if we were to cross XY and XX, you get XX, XY, XX, XY, right? But like, if we went for X big A, Y, this person must have at least got one of these copies. She can't have two, because if she did, she'd be an affected female, which is not the case. So she has to be X a big A, X little A like that, right? Now, if we were to cross these two, you'd have x big A, y, x big A, and x little a. So x big A, x big A, x big A, y, x big A, x little a, x little a, y. Would you see that? That's an affected male. So therefore, that's probably what it is. If it was the other way around, if we said it was dominant, then let's go and see that then, right? When you're doing these kind of questions, you have to test these things, if that makes sense. You've got to try and see what, like, um, you to test it with our dominant, test it with the recessive, see if it adds up, basically. So here, now I'm going to swap them around, and I'm going to say that A is A gamma, big A, and then little a is healthy now, this time around. So if we do that, this geezer is a healthy male. So that means he's going to have to have X little a, Y. And this is a healthy female, which means it has to be X little a, X little a, right? Can't have A because it's big A because it's dominant. Immediately, you can see that it's not possible to have a child with A gamma globulinemia because little a, little a, little a. There's no dominant there to begin with, right? So here, it's literally impossible for it to be dominant. So it has to be recessive and it has to be sex linked. So there you go. And then you just type, you just write down the evidence that you've collected. So it's recessive as well. So the reason for all of this is because if we look at parents five and six, parent uh, five must have been heterozygous and six is an unaffected male, but they ended up having male uh, male affected, right? So that means, therefore, five was a carrier. They had one copy that was healthy and then one copy that had the condition. So there you go.
Savicki syndrome is a genetic disease that shows a recessive inheritance pattern. The allele responsible for this is found on chromosome 18. Two carriers have six children. Calculate how many of the six children would you expect to have Vicky syndrome or be carriers of it. So if we have two carriers, right, this is found on chromosome 18. It's a singular allele, so it's going to be monohybrid inheritance. If it's monohybrid inheritance, then you're going to have big V is, uh, so what they told you, it's recessive, right? So big v, v is healthy, little v is the syndrome. So if we're crossing big V, little v, big V, little v, right? It's going to be big V, big V, big V, little v, big V, little v, little v, little v. So then how many of them have it? One, right? But it's asking how many of the six children. So in that case, it's going to be one in four times six, which is you know, one, you can't have 1.5. Well, sorry, it's 1.5, but you can't have 1.5 of a child. So it's got to be one, right? So then for the carriers, carriers are those that have the both of them, right? That's not this geese is not a carrier because big V, big V, and that one's effective. So that means it's going to be two out of four times six, which is three. There you go. So here it says a daughter of these parents and a male carrier, Vicky syndrome, have a child calculated probability of them having Vicky syndrome. So if the male carrier is big V, little V, right, then we need to figure out the possibilities of the daughter is now if they're going to end up having a child with Vicky syndrome, then you know, this, this um, daughter must be this, as in must also be heterozygous. So if you cross those, I think we've done it up here, to be honest, you get one in four. There you go. Here, we've got to do multiple levels of this, right? So the daughter of these parents and a male carrier have a child. So the probability of a daughter being a carrier, V little v, in order to have a child with Vicky syndrome, they need to be a carrier, is going to be, if we have a look, a carrier, remember, was two in four. All right, two in four from the original point. The, prob the probability, sorry, of the daughter being little v, little v is one in four, right? From the previous part. Then it says a male carrier of this as a child. So this, this geese is already a male, ch male carrier. We know from the cross above that if you have a male carrier, the probability of them, if they're both heterozygous, is one in four. So if that's heterozygous, that's one in So the probability of being v, little v, and, you know, having a child with it is going to be two out of four times one out of four, which is 0 0.125. When you're dealing with probabilities, generally speaking, and equals it multiplying them, or is your adding. So we've got one probability there. The other probability is that this daughter was actually affected by it and then had a child to then go on and have it. Because the question's not told us whether the ch daughter has it or not. So then big V, little v for the male, little v, little v. So big V, little v, little v, little v, big V, little v, little v, little v. So the probability of the daughter having it initially was this, but then the probability of being little v, little v and a child with it has got to be one over four, probability of the daughter being little v, little v, and the probability of having it, which is two out of four, which is 0 0.125. So then the probability of for, you know, one or two is if this is one or two is going to be, remember, or is add, so it's going to be one, 0 0.125 plus 0 0.125, which is going to be 0 0.25. There you go. DNA profiling can be used to analyze the risk of inheriting conditions such as a gamma globulinemia and Vicky syndrome. To produce a DNA profile, DNA first needs to be purified. Explain why a protease enzyme is added to the mixture during the, the DNA purification process. So protease proteins. For some reason, we have a sample of somebody's DNA and we're adding something that breaks down proteins in it. So we need to think what the possible link between this and proteins are. So in your head, you should be thinking, hmm, uh, DNA and proteins. What do I know about DNA and proteins? A lot of people just completely fumbled. Some people were just like, it breaks down protein. Other people said breaking peptide bonds in DNA. There are no peptide bonds in DNA, dude. Um, DNA and proteins, to me, proteins that are with DNA histones, right? If we're trying to get DNA strands, we need to get rid of all those histones in the way. It's just to remove or hydrolyze histones. This question's come up a couple of times, actually, a similar theme where it's like, oh, they've added a protease. Why? This is why. DNA samples can be amplified using PCR. In theory, how many fragments of DNA might be present at 12 cycles of PCR? Assume one DNA fragment was present at the beginning of the start of the process. And give your answer as a log 10 value. So if we have one, if we have one fragment, right? And if we do one cycle, we get two because we double each time, right? If I then do the second cycle, we're times by two again, so we get four. Third cycle, we get times by two, we get eight, right? That means that three cycles was two times two times two, which gave you eight, right? So then you could have said that then three cycles equals your starting one times two cubed, yeah? So that means that if we have 12 cycles, it's gonna be a starting amount one times two to the 12, which if you do that, you get 4096. But the question once is a log 10 value. So all you do is you put log 10, 4096 in your um, calculator and you'll end up getting whatever that ends up being, which is 3.61, right? We're not done because 
They want it as a log 10 value, but that's not the same as this. They want this number expressed using this, right? So this is, this is a hideous question. In order to undo a log, you need to raise it to a power again. So the actual answer would be 10 to the 3.61 because it says fragments. They don't want the log 10 value of the fragments only. They want you to log 10 it and then show you can undo the log 10 to get back to the fragments. This is a hideous question. I think it's really just, just, just not good. It says suggest why the figuring that you calculated in part two might not be done in practice. When you're doing the polymerase chain reaction, you've got to heat it to high temperatures. You've got to add nucleotides. You've got to add primers and you've got to let it do its thing with its temperature changing and all that stuff, right? Like if you, um, run out of any of those things happening, then, you know, we um, can't carry on doing the PCR. So in that case, it's just any of them, to be honest. So what I might jump ahead and say is um, you maybe have, like, not enough nucleotides. You can't say bases here. you got to say nucleotides because it's the whole thing, not just the base. The base is just the, you know, the nitrogenous base bit. We're not, we, you need the whole thing. You need the deoxyribose and the phosphate. So you can't, that's why you can't say bases. And you can't say lack of enzymes either because the enzyme is speeding up the reaction without being used in the process. It's still there. So then it says, state in the name of the enzyme used in PCR to synthesize new DNA strands. Some people said RNA polymerase. What? DNA strands? Other things as well, people said as DNA ligase and helicase. The question is saying to make new DNA strands. If you're making a new DNA strand, you are joining DNA nucleotides together, right? The only thing that's joining DNA nucleotides together is DNA polymerase. DNA ligase is used to join a fragment to something you've just cut with restriction endonuclease. For example, putting a gene fragment or DNA fragment into uh, a plasmid, for example. DNA helicase breaks the helix, it breaks hydrogen bonds, and RNA polymerase joins RNA nucleotides to make an RNA strand. DNA fragments are separated to produce a DNA profile using electrophoresis. A student wrote the following description. We will set up an IGNRS gel plate and then place the DNA sample in the wells of the cathode. Voltage will then be passed through this gel for one minute. The gel will then be placed at a purified water, in purified water and then we'll be able to see the banding pattern of each DNA sample. Describe two changes you would use to their procedure, make to their procedure, sorry, and explain how these would improve electrophoresis. So immediately, they just said they're putting gel into this thing and we're able to see the banding pattern. You're putting DNA into the well, you're letting it separate, you can't see DNA on its own with just normal light. Like, you have to put something in it to be able to see. So immediately, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add fluorescent probes, DNA probes specifically, to be able to see the bands formed. I see a lot of people, to be honest, forget this step. And it's, you know, that's not something I see a lot. I, expl I ask them, you know, all right, talk me through electrophoresis. Tell me what happens in it. And they're like saying every single other step that like kind of doesn't have any relevance to actually doing it. And then say, so yeah, so you can see bands. And I'm like, right, but you can't actually see them without a probe or a stain or something like that. You physically can't. As well as that, it says we put voltage through the gel for a minute and the gel will be then placed in a purified water and then we'll be able to see the banding. All they've done is they've got gel. They put these fragments in the gel like this in a well, right? And that's it. How on earth is it going to move, dude? There's nothing there to actually carry the charge to separate them. You have to put a buffer solution in there. Otherwise, what's going to make them move? It's just you're just electrocuting gel awkwardly. So then the other thing is, is add a buffer solution to carry the charge and separate the fragment. So lots of people just kind of said, add a buffer and that's it. But they didn't explain why. You have to talk about why and what you're doing as well. So accurate analysis of ecosystems biodiversity requires a detailed classification of organisms. The spruce pine plant is given the binomial name this, place and tick next to the box of the species most closely related to this. So we always do genus and then species, right? So whatever's the most related is going to share the same genus, right? Or I, you can't have the same species again. This one's a whole ass different species and a different genus, so you're out. Here, this is, made, although it has the same species name, it's from a different genus, so that's out. Resinosa different species, but same genus. So it's looking pretty good. And here, same species name, but different genus. So that's that. So the only closest one is this one. There you go. So now it says, explain why Pinus glabra and uh, humans, homo sapiens, are classed in the same domain, but different kingdoms. B domain, kingdom, phylum, and so forth, right? So what's the only similarity between you and a pine plant? Any ideas? Anyone? It's because they're both eukaryotes. Domains are eukaryotes. Because domains, you have bacteria, eukaryota, and archaea. So they're in the same one, it's the same domain really, sorry, because both are eukaryotic or both eukaryotes, right? But then what's the difference? So different kingdom, your kingdoms are animals, plants, fungi, etc., right? 
So different kingdoms, it's because we are animals, not plants. So here, it's different kingdom because we're animals, not plants, but you have to explain why. Here, we can, that's enough to say it's the same domain because they're both eukaryotic, that's enough. But here, we need to say, you know, why we're in a different kingdom as well, if that makes sense. So first of all, it's a different kingdom because it's animals, hum humans are animals and not plants, but you need to say why, which seems a bit pedantic, but you know, like, there's, you can't just say that, you know, it doesn't show why we're in a different kingdom. You need to show why we are separated in that sense. Well, for example, is that they do not photosynthesize. There you go. Whereas this, you can say both eukaryotes because eukaryote or prokaryote, that's a fine. But here you can't just say that, oh, it's because we're not plants. That doesn't really explain why. So a scientist sampled species of trees in two different habitats containing this, and here's the results of sampling. So we've got different species, uh, number of individuals in habitat A, fine, and then here B as well, fine, cool. Then it says, using the Simpsons index of diversity, the scientists calculated D of habitat A to be this. Use the formula given to calculate the index of diversity of habitat B and show you're working, and then say which of A and B has the greater biodiversity. So this means one minus sigma means the sum of, little n is the number with you know of a spe sorry number of individuals in a species and then big n is number of all individuals right so then here they're asking you to do it for b so i'm going to work out big n by just adding all of these up first so if i do that we get 60 plus 10 plus 20 plus 10 plus 4 which gives me 104 Right now, this formula says that you have to go and get little n, which is the number of a species, divided by big n, square it, and then add them all up. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to add. So this is going to be little n. I'm going to make another column, which is big. Sorry, little n over big n all squared. Because then I can just quickly work all of that out. Because the first one would be 60 out of 104, and then so forth like that. But and then square it. Sorry. So if I do that, we get three. We get 0 0.39013. So then. The index of diversity is going to be D, well, it's going to equal 1 minus what we just worked out there, so 0 0.39013, which roughly gives you 0 0.61. So then, that's going to be 0 0.61. The one with the greater biodiversity is going to be A. There you go. So habitat B was situated beside a lake and showed evidence of ecological succession. The scientists plan to investigate how the biodiversity changed from the edge of the lake to the other side of B. State the collective name for the animal and plant populations are present at the end of prim primary succession. So when you've got primary succession, you have your pioneer species, they come along, they die and do this and that, change the biotic and biotic features, more things come along, they outcompete each other and so forth until eventually you hit the point where it's kind of stable and you have a big ecosystem full of lots of different things with lots of different species, lots of different things, and it's a fully finished, done thing. And that's called, I, that's going to be a climax, but then it's all of the, you know, animal and plant populations, of different species, community. So that's what it's called. A climax population would just be one singular species, but this is different animal and plant species, so it has to be community. That's why it's that word. Suggest so how the scientists can achieve the following during the investigation. So we want to sample all stages of succession in the habitat. We want to minimize sampling bias, and then we want to sample insect biodiversity. So there's different ways along doing this. Well, obviously, if we're looking at all stages of succession, what we need to do is we need to look at patterns in this, right? So if we're looking at patterns, and they're saying, what is it here? Uh, edge of a lake to the other side of B, right? They're going from one place. They want to see how the number and distribution of organisms, where they are and how they're found and how many of them there are in species, changes. So obviously, if we're going this way, we want to find a pattern, right? It could be there's more and less of this. So what you would need to do is rather than throwing quadrants around randomly, you have to do them systematically in regular intervals. So what you're going to do is you're going to use a transect. So a quadrant and then like, I don't know, five meters, another one, another one, another one, and so forth, right? And then you can see the pattern across. So here, what we're going to do is we're going to be using a transect, right? And then to avoid bias, what you're going to do is you're first of all going to randomly select where you're setting up these transects. But then as well as that, you're going to place quadrats at fixed intervals. So then you can't be like, oh, I like the look of that place, you know, fixed intervals, like e.g. like, I don't know, every meter or something like that, every two meters or something like that. And also random selection of sampling sites. So the random selection of sampling sites more so means like, for example, here's the coast, or the lake, sorry, and there's the end of habitat B. I could go here and then start and then go up like this every one meter, or I could go here and start every one meter. So to avoid bias, I can just instead of being like, oh, I like this part, so I'm going to go here, I can use a random number generated by like, you know, making some coordinates for a starting position and be like, okay, here it is and then systematically work like that. That's what that bit means. Then, to sample index biodiversity, we need to know the number of the species of different insects, and we also need to know the number within each of them, right? So in order to be able to do that, we actually have to capture them, but also be able to look at them physically and have a look. So you can't really just go ahead and say, mark, release, recapture, that's the, just the entire technique. It's saying, what is this geezer going to do to actually get this, right, to do this? So here, you could use sweep nets, for example, and capture them like that. Can't use quadrats because they're moving things. Like, if you have a very slow-moving thing, or something that's 
barely moving or not moving at all, then you can use a quadrat. Whereas here, these are insects that are going to be moving around, so it wouldn't be practical to sit and try and count how many there are in a quadrat. The scientists also measured primary production in both the woodland and lake habitats, suggest the units they should use to measure primary production in the two habitats. Primary production is the amount of energy that's converted from sunlight by plants into biomass, chemical energy, right? So it's going to be an energy measurement, first of all, so it's going to be a kilojoule thing, right? But also, because we're also going to do it across different areas, it has to be per meter squared, otherwise we can't really compare the two of them. We want it because if I sample this one area here, for example, and then this one here, I can't compare the two because the areas are different. But if I make it per meter squared, as in one meter squared of area gives you this, right? One meter squared gives you that, one meter squared here, I can compare them a bit better. So there's that. But as well as that, we need to do it over a time frame. Because let's say I do this over like three years and this one over one. I can do it per year and that will allow better comparison as well. However, this is in a lake, right? Now, in a habit woodland, you live on the floor. You don't float about. Whereas in a lake, you are distributed in more than two planes. Like in a woodland, you're either here and here. In a lake, you also float up and down. So now we have a different, trickier problem in the sense that, like, we have a volume to deal with instead. So rather than an area of the flat land we're going to be using, we're going to be using kilojoules per meter cubed of volume per year. So obviously that gets a bit tricky when it comes to comparing the two, but it's the best thing you can do, for example, if you're comparing different lakes. There you go. Right, okay, so the process of ultrafiltration in the kidney shares similarities with the formation of tissue fluid. Describe the similarities and differences between the two. So rapid fire crash course. Right, what happens is you get an artery, they all branch off into arterioles and so forth until eventually get to arterioles and then they become capillaries like this, right? And then capillaries then end up becoming venules and then veins and so forth. So here, if you think about it, the pressure in the artery is so much higher than these capillaries. And it's almost like you've got the capillaries will have gaps between them like these little holes. So if you do that, things like to go and flow and move down a pressure gradient, as in they want to go from higher to lower pressure. So the options are that some, some of this stuff is going to go this way and some of it's going to go out this way because it's a lower pressure. In your blood, you've got red blood cells, you've got proteins, you've got plasma, you've got loads of different molecules like sugars, ions, all kinds of stuff, right? And this is intentional because what happens is here, the high pressure forces water and all these little solutes out into the surroundings, and that is your tissue fluid. Then what happens is at the venule end, not the venule, the venule end of the capillaries, water will move back in via osmosis. Because if you think about what's happened in here, you've got all this water that's now gone, and now you just left with cells and proteins. So the water potential in this part, only after it's been squeezed out, is quite low. So in order to rebalance things, some of it moves back in here like that, right? And then any excess is drained off by the lymph vessels, which then take it back to your veins and then return it to your right heart. In the kidneys, you have your afferent arteriole, which becomes a bundle of capillaries, and then your efferent arteriole, which goes off and then eventually wraps around the nephron and so forth until it eventually becomes a capillary. Uh, sorry, these capillaries here, and it eventually becomes a renal vein. Then at this part, that bundle of capillaries is the glomerulus, and it filters into the Bowman's capsule, which then becomes the proximal nearby convoluted tubule, this descending loop of Henle, which is really short here, ascending loop of Henle, the distal is in far away or distant bendy convoluted tubule, and then you're collecting ducts like this, and then you eventually pee it all out. So in the same sense, it's quite literally the same thing. There's a higher pressure here than there is here. So what happens is stuff gets squeezed out. Rather than going this way, it's obviously squeezed out all the water and solutes into the Bowman's capsule. And then it goes in here, and then it does all of its journey through that. The only difference is, though, however, is that if we think about the layers involved, in tissue fluid, you are a capillary. You're getting out of the capillary endothelium, out of the epithelium into the area. Whereas here into the Bowman's capsules, you're going into multiple layers. You're going to three layers. So you're going through the capillary endothelium, the basement membrane, and then through these podocytes into the Bowman's capsule as well like that. So now, similarities and differences is based on what we just said there. So both of them, both similar, right, is that they involve capillaries and high arterial pressure forcing H2O and solutes out, right? As well as that, proteins, or well, large proteins, and cells remain inside. Actually, as a side point, white blood cells are able to move out in both as well. So white blood cells can move out of capillaries there. Move out of capillaries. The reason is if you smack your hand really hard and it gets bruised and swollen and hot, it's because your capillaries, they're one cell thick or whatever, right? But they can get leakier and there's gaps between them. So fluid can get out, which is why it starts to get swollen. And also white cells are able to get out. That's how we get an infection, you know, results. So if you have an infection in your fingertip, for example, then the capillaries have to move out and like spread out the cells so that they can actually get those white cells out into the tissue. Otherwise, they're just trapped in your blood. So here as well, really, white blood cells can move out to capillaries as well. As well as that, both involve, as well, just as an extra note, for an OCR specific thing is that both of them involve basement membranes, right? But again, the capillaries and the tissue fluid only have one layer to go through really, rather than like three. 
So what's the differences then? Well, if you think about it, tissue fluid, where's that going? It's going to the surrounding spaces of tissues, right? So in tissue fluid, the fluid surrounds the cells, whereas in the um, kidney, the fluid enters the Bowman's capsule, right? And as well as that, it also has to pass through three layers. This only passes through one, right? As well as that, the excess tissue fluid is drained into the lymphatic system. Drained, haha, uh, like drinking. Lymphatic system, whereas in the um, kidney, your excess is passed as urine, isn't it? So excess passed as urine. And as an extra point as well, in the kidneys, the capillaries form a knot, right? Whereas in um, tissue fluid, they just act as networks. So what I mean by that? What I mean by that is that your afferent becomes a bundle of capillaries here, and then it's still an efferent arterial, whereas in the tissue fluid, it's arterial end, venial end, and it comes back eventually. You have this little knot here, and then in the kidneys, it forms like all these networks and all this stuff around the nephron until it eventually becomes, becomes a um, venial at the end and re renal vein and so forth. That's the difference there. So anyway, there you go. So a person's glomerular filtration rate provides an indication of the health of their kidneys. The GFR is the measure of volume of blood that can be filtered by the kidneys every minute. GFR can be estimated by monitoring the blood concentration of creatinine, which is a breakdown product of creatine phosphate and muscle, suggests two characteristics of a patient that must be taken into account when using this GFR measurement to diagnose kidney damage and explain why they must be considered. So immediately, even if you can't remember these, because you do kind of have to know a couple of like what the purposes of GFR and stuff is in dialysis and all that jazz, right? Is if you have a look, the questions told you that creatinine is a breakdown product of creatine phosphate in muscles. So immediately, muscle mass is one of them. Because if you have more muscles, you're inevitably going to have more creatinine, right? And then as well as that, other things as well. So it's all about how well your kidneys can filter every minute. So for example, you can talk about age, but you need to say why. So here as well, sorry, muscle mass, because well, I should have said, whoops, more muscles means more creatinine produced, right? And then here, age, for example, because kidney function can decline with age. Other points you could have said as well as diet, for example, if you have, um, you can know, they can, this can mess up stuff, the amount of phosphate, for example, of creatine or creatinine in there as well. It allows use of creatine supplements as well. Other things as well as gender, because men and women have different muscle mass, not a fan of that one personally. And then also as well as that, um, genetic makeup as well. Like men and women, muscle mass isn't really a, you know, a bit dated, but whatevs. If kidney damage is suspected, the patient's urine is likely to be tested for the protein, albumin. Explain why the presence of albumin in the urine indicates kidney damage. So we need to think about the journey that it's all taken. So here it is again, wiggle, 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 all of that, proximal convoluted tubule, descending limb, ascending limb, all of this, distal convoluted tubule, blah, 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 here, here, collecting duct, like that, and then urine. What actually entered here? What entered here is fluid and solutes, and then it goes through all of this, blah, blah, blah. It's all to hinge on this part here with the glomerulus, because what leaves the glomerulus? Water and solutes and all that stuff, right? What doesn't stay in the, the glomerulus? What doesn't leave the glomerulus big things like tissue fluid like proteins so here why are they testing for a protein in urine that indicates the kidney damage is because albumin is it must be that because albumin is a large protein and shouldn't enter the bowman's capsule and that's exactly what it is to be honest because if you look at the glomerular capillary glomerulus and all that capillaries right we've got these gaps here if there's damage then the albumin's got to get out and pass through three different whole ass layers to get into the bowman's capsule and eventually in your piece so you got some pretty hefty damage other things you can check for as well is um blood so you shouldn't have blood in your urine either, and that indicates there could be damage along that as well. But there you go. Thank you very much. I hope that helped. Please like, share, and subscribe.